why don't you just take us back to October 3rd. What was your day like that day before the tornado hit? Tell me about it. Uh, well, I remember it had been raining all day long and uh, just a typical day. I uh, just got off, got off the school bus up um, on Meekin Drive uh, with a bunch of kids that lived in the neighborhood and we were just walking home and I just remember very specifically that the clouds were this really creepy yellow color, yellow green, and just all of us pointing up to the sky commenting on the color and ex how fast the, the uh, clouds were going because they were just whipping by really, really fast. I'm going to stop you there for one second. Um, just one thing I forgot to tell you is I'm not I'm I'm actually not on camera. So um, if I don't if I'm not verbally um, reacting to your story, okay. it's, it's not because I'm not interested. It's just <laughs> I don't want my voice to be stepping <laughs> no on your problem. story. So okay, uh, I just forgot to say that as a, as a, as we're getting winding up here. Okay. Um, okay. So you're you're getting off the bus and you see the clouds. Um, tell me a little bit about. Uh, your reaction and the other kids reaction when you're looking at those clouds what were you thinking uh, we just uh we've never seen or i've never seen clouds go by that low that fast and especially that color so it was a very distinct yellowy weird color and we were all just kind of pointing at it and surprised oh, look at the clouds look at the clouds you know and and um and then it was raining pretty hard uh so we started walking home faster so you lived on meekin i lived on settler circle and the bus dropped us off up at Meekin Drive on Pequannock Ave, right by the, um, the the cemetery. So when it started, so it started to rain. So tell me what you did after that. Uh, well, we got to the top of our street, and it was um, Michelle Matthews, Jeff Bosco, and I, because Settler Circle is a dead end street. And Michelle went home. She's the first house on the right. I lived in the second house on the right. So uh, Jeff started to go home, and at this time it got darker and um, you could hear what sounded like freight trains and it, the sound was getting louder and louder and I just thought it was a bunch of trees falling down the brook because across the street is a brook that runs through the neighborhood and seeing as it was getting darker and windier and um, you know I just thought it was trees falling so I ran up to my front door and at this time Jeff turned around and he came to my house because it was just kind of getting really scary and loud and dark that I don't think he thought he could make it home. So he came running over to my, um, my house and I remember trying to get my car key, my house keys uh, out of my purse and I was just really scared and nervous and I was trying to fumble in my purse for the keys and I couldn't find them. And then I looked over and I noticed my brother's car was in the driveway. And he went to the University of Hartford, so he didn't live at home, but he just happened to be home that afternoon. And um, when I noticed his car in the driveway, I just started ringing the bell and knocking on the door to try to get him to open up the door because it was getting louder and darker and more windy and raining and it was just really scary and chaotic. So um, he came to the door and he let us in and uh, the house was a raised ranch with a completely f finished downstairs basement. And downstairs was a family room and there was um, a fireplace, that a granite stone fireplace my dad had built that was floor to ceiling and it ran, ran almost um, half the width of the house. This was a massive stone fireplace down in our family room. So anyway, we're all standing on the, uh, on the foyer and it's raining really hard now and I had asked my brother if he had shut the windows because I remember leaving a window open in my bedroom and he said yes he went around the house shut all the windows and I said well let me just double check because it's raining really hard so uh, I start to go up the stairs and Jeff um, I don't recall how he got to the top of the stairs but he was up at the top of the stairs right kind of in the doorway where the kitchen was and my brother was standing on the foyer and I get about halfway up the stairs and it's really loud and the noise, the train noise and dark and all of a sudden you could just hear psh at once all of the windows in the house just exploded, just broke and I turned around and I looked down into our family room which was um, completely done and I could see in very slow motion which was really weird, I, I'll never forget this, it was slow motion Every single piece of the plate glass window that was in the front of the house above the couch 
in little teeny pieces, it slow motion, it all flew at once across the room. And just like almost everything stopped. And I very specifically heard a voice behind me say, go into the foyer closet, which I swear is my guardian angel because you know, I'm 14 years old, I'm just like in shock. And so I did. As, and right before I went into the foyer closet, as I was looking downstairs, all of a sudden the picture window just went choom and it was gone and everything started happening again in, in normal speed. So I go down into the foyer closet and I shut the door and I'm in the foyer closet and I'm standing on the shoe tree and you know the coats are in there and I've got the door closed and I realize what happened to my brother? Where'd he go? And I did the one thing I probably shouldn't have done is I opened up the door. And the second I opened up the door, the closet door just flew out of my hand. And I stuck my head out and I started screaming his name, Tom, Tom, where are you, you know? And I was literally in the funnel cloud because it was so loud and so chaotic and windy and, and the noise was screaming loud and I could feel like sand and everything like hitting at my face. And then I realized, well, he's not going to hear me. And I also realized I'm starting to get sucked out of the closet from the pressure. So I push myself back into the closet and I scrunch down on the floor, curled up in a ball, and I'm just holding on inside to the frame as hard as I could like this um, so I wouldn't get sucked out. And I ended up passing out. Because what happened, I found out later, is when I had stuck my head out of the closet, um, something flew by and hit me in the back of the head. And I had a huge egg-sized bump later on in the back of my head and a severe concussion and all that. And I also um, got hit by something in my hand, too, because my hand was all swollen and everything. So um, I ended up passing out, which probably saved my life because now I was just dead weight. And all of a sudden, I hear my brother, Linda, Linda, are you okay? Are you okay? And I open up my eyes and I come to, and he pulls me out of the closet and we're standing on the foyer. And I look up and I see sky and some blue sky and sunshine. Like there was no more roof. Um, half the house was gone. And come to find out, my brother had dove down into the family room and, and rolled into the hallway, because when everything exploded. Jeff, who I have no, I don't know if you've talked to him, but I have no idea how he lived because he just kind of dove behind the three or four foot wall before the first bedroom door upstairs and just hung on. And um, so my brother was great. You know, he shut off the electricity, the water, everything. Uh, he got a frozen chicken for my hand that I could put on my hand for the swelling. Um, so uh, it's incredible. Yeah. So far, what you've told me. Um, so let's 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 go back just a little bit. Um, when you were, do you remember when you were in the closet? Did you know it was a tornado, or do you remember what no. you were thinking, or were you just in survival mode at that point? Yeah, pretty much in survival mode. I mean, I had no idea. I'm 14 years old. Tornadoes did not happen in Connecticut. I mean, it was just unheard of. So I had no idea. You know what the the sound of the train was the funnel cloud and all, you know, I just didn't know. Um, so I learned about it afterwards, but at that time it was just totally survival mode. So you got out of the closet, your, your brother helped you, um, Jeff is, up, is upstairs, there's still an upstairs even though there's not a roof, correct? Correct, we, the roof was gone, um, the front wall was still there and I think the side wall and some of the back wall the dining room and living room which was on the left side of the stairs um, that was pretty much gone and my mother had a woman mail her back a canceled check that my mom had in a wall unit up in the dining room from Pittsfield Mass that's how far it traveled mm -hmm. so in, in, the, in the moments afterwards after you, you know everybody's okay um, you're, you're taking care of your wounds. Tell me, tell me what the next few minutes were like. Were you, did you go outside? Did you just stay there? Did you try to call someone? What did you do? Well, my brother walked me up the street and Jeff and straight up the street to a house that was still there and said, okay, stay here, you know, I'll, I'll be back. Of course, I didn't listen to him, <laughs> 14 years old. I started to wander and I went across the street and I found a house that had um, a telephone. 
So I called my mom at work. And I remember saying to her when she answered the phone, I said, um, Mom, Tom and I are okay, but the house is gone. And she just said, what? I heard about a storm. What's going on? I don't understand. And I just said, Tom and I are okay, but the house is gone. And she just kind of, she dropped the phone. She was just <gasps> inhaled and dropped the phone and her boss came on and said, what's going on? I said, well, there's been a really bad storm, but we're okay, but there's no house. And so then he, you know, hung up and took care of my mom. And then I kept wandering and I went up to um, Del Drug. And when I got up there, and again, I was in total shock. Um, when I got up there, I remember seeing uh, there was a man that had died. He was in his pickup truck, and I guess a, a pipe or something went through his chest. And I remember seeing him laying there um, covered in a sheet. And I was just wandering, and somebody came up to me and said, are you OK? And I just showed him my hand. I didn't really say much. And he said, come with me. And he puts me in a helicopter. and flies me away <laughs> and I ended up going to I think it was a Yukon Medical Center out in Farmington and um, and they treated me there for a severe concussion I, nothing was broken in my hand um, and I remember them telling me that they were expecting a lot of injuries but not a lot of people showed up there but they were ready for them and um, I actually got interviewed on a radio station when I was there <laughs> some of my friends had heard me that night so, so your brother didn't know, probably didn't know where you were at that point. So what, what, when did he finally realize, you know, where's Linda? <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure who I called back then. I don't really remember um, how that all took place. We didn't have cell phones or anything. Uh, I did have an aunt whose in-laws lived out in that area, and they picked me up from the hospital that night. And uh, I ended up getting back to Windsor. Um, I have another aunt that lives in Windsor on Silver Birch Road, and that's where my whole family was. So when I finally got to my family, they were asking me, you know, what was it like and everything like that, and I just kept saying, well, it's, I remember there was a lot of trees down and there's some damage to some houses, but I didn't remember the full extent of the damage till I went back the next day. So, so let's, let's jump forward to that. Um, so now you've been to the hospital, you're, you're, you're okay, thank goodness. Um, when did you tell me when you went back and tell me what your reaction was when you went back to the neighborhood? Uh, the next day they let, let us in and it was complete shock. Like I was seeing it all for the first time. And it was total devastation. Um, my mom grew up in World War II Germany and she lived right outside of Nuremberg and she remembers all the bombings and everything and she said it brought her back to her childhood that it looked like a bomb went off. There was just, you know, full-grown trees were sticks. I mean, just houses devastated one after the other. And in my shock, I, you know, I just did not remember all that. So it was quite, quite surprising and shocking the next day. Um, so your house was not livable? No. So where, where did you stay? Um, my sister had an apartment, and then, you know, we had relatives that took us in, and um, thankfully, El Grasso you know, provided the, um, the trailers. Uh, we did have some electricity. We had a telephone that worked on the street because every house on our road except for one was completely destroyed. And um, the governor, she made her headquarters in our basement because we had a working phone. So she was at our house a lot um, using the phone. So, t so tell me, your, we've, we've heard some great stories about Ella Grasso and what a great broad she was, you know, <laughs> so tell me. Tell me what your feelings were about her. Um, again, I was 14, so I, I, I don't, you know, know a lot about her, but I do remember my parents spoke highly of her. She was at our house a lot, and she was amazing because she really did take charge. And she got us the campers um, to put on our house uh, on the driveway right away as soon as we had enough of the, um, the lot cleared because we had a lot of our house and our neighbors' houses in our backyard um, with debris. But... Um, my dad was an electrician and he knew a lot of people in the trade and they came to our house and helped build it and we were one of the very first people or I think we were actually the first people back into our house um, from the tornado from from the neighborhood so tell me what uh, the cleanup was like what you were what you remember now you're you're a kid um, so uh, you're and you're not back at school yet but there must have been something uh, a feeling a vibe in your neighborhood tell me what that cleanup was like 
Well, it was amazing. The whole town came together. I mean, people, I remember them forming, you know, like a long chain of humans and, and passing garbage and debris um, to help clean up. I remember the Red Cross came and they handed us, um, you know, pack uh, toothbrushes and things like that. And they always were there for a meal and something hot to drink every day. There were the trucks. Um, I remember Bob's stores were just starting and they gave us all money, a gift certificate to Get to go and get clothes because we didn't have many clothes, you know, whatever we could find. Um, what kind of what kind of material things do you recall losing? Not that that was important, which everybody has brought up, but what do you remember losing material-wise? Um, well, I lost, you know, pretty much everything in my bedroom. Salvaged some uh, clothes. Um, it was really interesting cleaning up because I didn't have a roof over my bedroom, but I had two walls left standing and the outer walls. And I would pick something up that was, or I was trying to clean up my dresser. And 14, I didn't dust very well. So, but something, there would be a spot where something was completely gone. I couldn't even find whatever knickknack or something that was. You could see the, the dust ring. And then right next to it, something stayed perfectly and didn't move an inch. That always struck me as really interesting and, and I, it's just weird how the wind would just come in and take something away but leave two inches away something standing there perfectly like it never moved. Did, um, tell me about going back to school. Um, I'm sure, so this was a Wednesday, I'm sure you didn't go the rest of that week, but do you remember returning back to school? I don't remember when I returned back, no. You don't re do you remember, uh, I guess, do you remember, uh, was it hard to acc acc acclimate? acclimate. <laughs> That's um, the word I'm trying to say, back? Or do you not really, wasn't that a strong memory at all? No, that wasn't a strong memory at all. Um, what I do remember is the weather. It took me years to not huddle in a corner <laughs> or run into a basement with a pillow and a, and a um, radio uh, when there was a really bad storm coming. Uh, that took a lot of years to get over. And that's interesting you bring that up because we've, we've heard really both sides of that. Um, several people um, in your neighborhood uh, had that same reaction for many years and still do. Um, I'm curious, do you, do you watch the weather even today? It, you know, do you, when, you, when the weather changes, do you watch it? Um, yeah, I watch it. I watch it a lot. I, I'm over the you know, trembling fear and all that, that went away many, many years ago, but I do watch the weather and I do remember when my kids were little about 17 years ago or so, there was really bad storms. I live in North Stonington. They had tornado warnings in New London and I made my family go into the basement, grabbing the dogs and the kids and so, but yeah, I'm, I'm a weather watcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know we, we, because we have some people that were really scared afterwards and some people that were more, um, needed to feel in charge and were, um, you know, quasi meteorologists after that, you know, <laughs> they just like they needed to take that power back, you mm -hmm. know, and other people that just weren't at that stage that could take that power back because they were just terrified and traumatized, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, just looking at my notes here. Um, tell me, um, if you have any recollect recollections of in your neighborhood, um, do you think what kind of impact do you think it had on your neighbors? Not not so much the physical part of your neighborhood, but what do you think the tornado did as far as um, changing or not changing your neighborhood? Um, you know, we were a close street anyway. You know, Settler Circle, all the kids would go out, we'd play all day long running around everybody's yards and wiffle ball in the circle. And so it, we, you know, we were close before and we stayed close afterwards, so. Yeah, we definitely heard that you guys were a tight, tight group, definitely. Um, one, one question that we're asking everybody also is, do you think that you had any, maybe what, what were your takeaways from this experience or, or lessons learned from going through something traumatic like that that, that you carry on in, in your, into your adulthood. Are there any? Life's precious and you know you just never know moment to moment and you just got to be grateful for every moment because I mean who would have thought a tornado you know I just got off the school bus and the next thing you know it, it was just it happened and very grateful to have survived that and you just have to remember that. 
let's see. I think you've gone through all of my questions here. Um, do you remember how people communicated um, back when they you said this was before cell phones? Do you remember a lot of um, people in your neighborhood? Um, the, the National Guard, uh, do you remember that kind of presence in your neighborhood? You mentioned the, the Red Cross, you might have touched on this already. Um, I mean, did it seem like, um, did it seem like there were a lot of strangers in your neighborhood is kind of what I'm trying to get at, well, is settling? Um, now, I remember the National Guard, they had blocked off the entrances to the neighborhood because my dad, even the night before, had said he tried to get to the house and they, they were stopping him from going into the house because they shut everything down. Um, so they. There was a big presence of National Guard, but there was a presence of so many people just coming together and helping and helping clean up, and you know that's what I remember. Mm -hmm. What was life uh, like living in the trailer? How was that? Um, that was okay, a little exciting, you know. They had a, I think it was a three-bedroom trailer. They were pretty big, um, so it was really great to just be able to be right there on the property and help with the cleanup and you know help my dad a lot getting the house uh, rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So, does any family still live in that air, uh, in, in that neighborhood? Your parents or no? We just sold the house uh, about four or five years ago. My mom passed, so. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I think you've gone through all my questions. Is there any, is there anything about the experience? Um, well, this is a question that that we've been asking a lot of people. What do, you, what do you want people to know about this experience? Um, this is a unique experience, it's a tra traumatic experience. Um, what, do you, what do you want people to come away with understanding about what you went through? That's a tough question, I never really <laughs> thought of that. Um, I don't know, I don't think, I don't know if I have an answer for that. To understand what I came through, um, I think you're I, answering it actually. Do you feel like you that really you had to go through it to really understand it? Is that is that kind of where you're coming from? That yeah, it, because it was so surreal, and it and it was it literally was almost like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I mean, there was the the funnel ended up going. It followed the brook, which was across the street. When it got to the um, embankment from the road that runs perpendicular. It bounced, and when it bounced, it bounced uh, a direct hit on the house next door to me, where the woman passed. Um, and then as it was bouncing over, it took half of our house away, and the living room and dining room. So, I mean, I was literally inside pretty much the funnel cloud, and I mean, there's really no way to describe it, and um, I guess you just have to live through it. So, so actually, we didn't we didn't touch on that. That you lived uh, next to the Dembrowskis. Yes, they were our neighbors. All right. So let's. Uh, we actually are going to be. Tom actually is going to be talking with us, and he has never talked publicly about it before. Wow. Um, but he's he his daughter is very interested in it, and has done. Uh, she did some project in um, her college for it, and he's the only one left. His parents are both gone. His brother is gone. Um, and so we haven't chatted with him yet, but he is very interested um, in telling his story. Do you remember the? Do you remember when they found her? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, again, we had a lot of debris in our backyard from our house and our neighbor's house, and I remember that in his house, it was just the foundation was there. I mean, they didn't have anything left. And when she went missing, nobody knew where she was, and. I think it took two or three days or something to find her and it was you know going through and picking up all the debris and pieces of things that were in our backyard um, you know we didn't know where she was she could have been back there and I do I remember when they found her across the street and in, in their backyard across the street and it was it was really sad very tragic um, we have um, we interviewed um, uh, T.J. Baresi and John Cosgrove, mm -hmm. and they say every year on October 3rd, wherever they are, they call each other or they have a they have a drink or 
Um, do you feel like you're kind of bonded, like you're a little society of like <laughs> <laughs> survivors? Do you, do you do you commemorate it? Do you think about it every? Uh, oh, I think about it every October third, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, I call my brother and I thank him for saving my life every October third. <laughs> Um, anything else that we didn't, I didn't touch on it, that you wanted to share? Is there something that I didn't ask you? I don't think so. That's pretty much the whole story. Um, That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had taken speech um, in high school, mm -hmm. and I was in a class full of seniors, mm -hmm. and I was a junior, and I was really nervous to get up, and I, what I wrote on was the tornado story, and it was perfect because it was, I was up there telling this story in front of the class and it was a really windy, rainy, nasty day and right in the middle of my story the lights went out. So <laughs> it was perfect. So it makes for a good story anyway.